On this week's show, we take you to the Stuco Town Hall meeting, talk with Vice President of Honor and Discipline Tosh Ray, climb a mountain with Boys Varsity Cross Country, and Chasmina Khan shares her thoughts on the all school summer rating. Lawrenceville's 10 minute newscast begins right now. From the studios inside the Lawrenceville School's historic Pop Hall, this is L10 with Aiden Duffy. Hello and welcome to this week's show. 16 fifth formers have been selected as semifinalists in the 64th annual National Merit Scholarship Program competition. Chosen from over 1.6 million students in about 22,000 high schools, these 16 Laurentians are among the less than 1% of U.S. high school seniors selected. On Saturday, Laurentians welcomed the Choate Boers for a day of athletic competition. Big Red fought hard, winning boys varsity cross country, girls varsity and junior varsity field hockey, boys JV soccer, girls varsity volleyball, and the boys varsity water polo matchups. Lawrenceville girls varsity cross country, boys varsity football, and boys varsity soccer fell to Choate with ties for girls varsity soccer and girls junior varsity soccer. On September 10th, Headmaster Steve Murray presented $65,000. Lawrenceville's annual donation to the Lawrence Township Education Foundation. Lawrenceville has now donated over 1.5 million to township schools in addition to providing many in-kind services. The funds will be used for programs that encourage innovation and enhance the learning environment. On Monday night, Student Council held a town hall meeting to discuss changes to the house visitation policy. L10 was there and brings you this report. A change in the house visitation policy was made this summer to address a number of concerns the deans and housemasters have seen in recent years. We wanted to uh, continue to emphasize um, our commitment to you know, um, healthy ways um, to do Lawrenceville well, uh, as well as uh, create um, and, and reaffirm the message that the house is a place of strength. So Stuco, like right when we got back on campus, uh, we heard about the news. We didn't know anything over the summer, like we've said countless times, like Mr. Eldridge has acknowledged. Um, and as disappointing and frustrating as that was, we still knew like we really, we had to do something. More than 100 students assembled in the Healy Room to share their thoughts and perspectives on the currently modified policy on visitation with Stuco, Dean Eldridge, and Dean Kossoff. Right when we got back on campus, we started talking to Mrs. Kossoff. We started talking to not just the administrators, but also students, uh, getting their views, which obviously we agreed with and we already knew how it affected us, but we wanted to know how it affected everybody. After much discussion, fifth formers Margo and Harrison expressed their feelings on the new visitation policy and the conversations that took place in the Healy Room. After the town hall meeting and after hearing other people's thoughts and voices, I kind of felt like um, I'm still like very much against the policy. I think it makes people feel like they don't have that sense of privacy that we need as boarders, especially um, being away from home. Different students have expressed that, you know, the administration didn't really include student voices in their conversation and didn't really um, talk to them about this and even send like an all school email about this before we got here. And it was just something that like they instated and it kind of felt like they weren't like um, they weren't expecting the backlash that um, or the magnitude of backlash that they got. Obviously, it's had immense impacts on, on all of us. Speaking just for me personally, I was roommates with, with Cameron Dana last year in Hamill, and he's a prefect now. And we lived together for an entire year, but now he, him being a prefect, me being the president of the school, we should be very trusted, yet we're not trusted to be behind a closed door in my, in my dorm or his dorm. The boys varsity cross country team is poised for another winning season. We tagged along on their weekly mountain workout and discovered their secret to success. It's a great tradition that we've been go going through for the last 11 years. Um, I think Kochi started way back when and there was a bit of a gap um, when he wasn't driving the buses and then 11 years ago I came along um, and he persuaded me to get a license and we've been able to get off campus every Thursday. From a running standpoint, again, it's a high intensity, low impact, you're doing hills, you're getting a good workout um, and then the towpath back is great. Um, and then just mentally to get off campus, I think it's great for the team to again spend some time together spend some time on the bus, spend some time with just us um, and no distractions other than the team and, uh, and running.
So the sequence for this workout is after a, a solid warm up, uh, the boys will do anywhere from four to eight reps. So what they'll do is they'll go 5K, which is their 5K race effort on the way up, and then jog on the way back down for recovery. Uh, after they do their mountain reps, uh, what they'll do is they'll do uh, a run, it's about five miles down to Washington Crossing from the mountain. And for that workout, they're again training, starting, just trying to get a little bit faster, working at their 5K race pace. We were trying to hit like uh, five minutes, 30 seconds per mile for uh, the hard portions on the way back and then dipping down under 520 um, for some of the really hard parts. Overall, we ended up averaging with rest just under six minutes per mile. So the whole point of this workout is to develop some strength. It's really one of the only places in the area where we can actually work hills, which they'll encounter at multiple courses, such as, as up at Blair. And yeah, just a good opportunity to build some strength and get some speed in. The second in a series of conversations with student council representatives, senior news correspondent Michaela Boxley checks in with Vice President of Honor and Discipline Tosh Ray and investigates the school's disciplinary process. So last year you talked a lot about um, wanting to educate the community about exactly what goes on in a DC. So could you tell me what the process is once somebody has been accused of a major school rule? Yeah, so typically it'll go through the housemaster first. Um, so if a teacher um, is suspicious of a student violating a school rule, then they'll notify the housemasters. Um, and then you'll have a conversation with your housemaster, which um, will focus in on what happened, like what the deal is. And then after that, um, if it is decided that it should arise to a major school rule level, then a DC will probably be scheduled within the next couple of days. Um, and in between the house master meeting and the DC, there will probably be a couple more house master meetings with um, Dean Eldridge or Ms. Kossoff or the level directors of whatever specific like area of violation it was. So, In the meeting room, in addition to the accused Laurentian, three students are present, Tosh and two members of the Honor Council. Also present are four adults the student in question's level director, their advisor, and a department head, as well as Dean of Students, Blake Aldridge. At this meeting, the student comes to tell the story of what happened during the incident in question, and those present will ask the student questions to clarify the story. The student is then asked to leave the room, during which time voting members discuss and vote on whether or not the student's actions violate a major school rule. Following that vote, their respective consequences are then discussed. Following this discussion, the information is then given to Headmaster Murray for his approval. Finally, Dean Eldridge notifies the student of the final decision and course of action. What do you feel is the importance of having the community really understand what the process is? Um, well, what I think is most important is that I know there's a bunch of people, at least me last year too, um, that don't know at all about the process. and. The administration is such a scary term sometimes, like people are like, oh, the administration, when in reality it's just like the faculty members you see on a daily basis and everything. So I think when you know more about the process or what's happening, you won't be as intimidated by, oh, like I could be having a major, a DC, like, which is scary in general, but at least you'll know more of the steps to go through. Finally tonight, in an effort to continue the dialogue around our all school summer reading, Home Fire by Camilla Shamsi, Shazmina Khan, Student Council Diversity Representative and Co-President of the Muslim Students Organization, offers her thoughts. As Student Council's Diversity Representative and as a Muslim student on campus, I believe that Home Fire was an inappropriate and extremely problematic selection for an all-school read. The story offers a very skewed and stereotypically narrow perspective of the life of an everyday Muslim and perpetuates Islamophobia to the greatest extent once again placing Muslims in association with terrorist groups like ISIS, sending the message that ordinary Muslims and terrorists are in the same party, that because they share the label of Muslim, they share something inherent. It is concerning that a group of educated faculty on campus that should be aware of the current political climate where Islamophobia is rampant, chose this book and failed to notice that the book they were choosing shows Muslims in a false and one-dimensional light. 
What is even more disturbing is that the administration has not even thought it important to address home fire and ex extremely questionable themes in this first month since school started, leaving it up to Muslim students in particular to have to bear the brunt of this poor decision and defend their religion. Because there was absolutely no discussion of Muslim life on campus preceding this, all of a sudden, Muslim students feel the responsibility to defend themselves against peers whose misconception about Islam may have been reinforced by a book about terrorism. I am not alone in my sentiments about home fire, and it is the widespread fear that because Muslim students comprise such a small percentage of the student body, administration has seen this as an opportunity to keep these discussions on the back burner. Thank you, Shazmina. That is our broadcast for this Friday night, September 28, 2018. From all of us here at L10, thank you so much for watching, and good night. <laughs>